advice, policy support, and education on Council's Code of Conduct. As you will see from my report, the work of the Office has increased substantially over the past year. Formal complaints are up over 100%, informal complaints are up over 200%, and I will mention only that the informal complaint process is one that is flexible, useful, and I want to recognize councillors for engaging in it. You have come to the table with residents and members, members of staff from time to time to resolve complaints that need not be brought forward publicly in this forum. I can also tell you that Toronto, having been the first municipality to establish the Office of an Integrity Commissioner and adopt a code of conduct, last year there were 17 other municipalities in this place, and now there are 22, and the number appears to be growing. Other municipalities find it useful, and I can tell you that as part of my work, I meet biannually by, with my fellow integrity commissioners to discuss uh, issues of mutual concern and to uh, share views and education. Uh, point of order, Councillor Thompson. Madam Speaker, the integrity commissioner is speaking. This is a very, very important issue. She is giving us her annual report. There's so many people standing around, walking around, talking. I really think that we owe some degree of integrity to offer to the integrity commissioner by listening to her, please. Okay, thank you, Madam Speaker. I really only have two housekeeping matters to mention. Uh, there are two uh, matters to be adopted. One of them involves uh, amending the complaint protocol to come into line with the new councillor expense policy in relation to legal fees. That's in the report. Uh, the other amendment is to bring the nomenclature dealing with the Public Inquiries Act in line with the complaint protocol. That's in the report. Neither are controversial. I will close by thanking Council for their support of the office and for being the first municipality to establish this office and continuing to be a leader in uh, emphasizing the importance of integrity in the municipal process. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions, uh, Councillor Carroll. Oh, Madam Speaker, I'm fine. I just put my name down to ask for the report if it wasn't done for the presentation. Yeah, and that I'm, I'm glad that you had put your name down for that because that's the proper procedure. Thank you. Okay, Councillor McConnell, do you have questions? I guess I do, Madam Speaker, and I apologize. I thought that when I asked this morning, I very specifically yeah, no, asked for. Uh, presentation so I didn't realize I had to ask again so now that I know that I'll do that next time um, so um, first of all thank you for the report and secondly particularly thank you uh, for uh, coming out um, and talking to our young protégés about the work of the all of the fairness commissioners and I think it was very helpful and uh, the feedback uh, was great um, I wanted to talk to you for a moment about gifts and benefits if I could um, and, um, and the report that you are about to uh, come forward with the lobby registrar, um, uh, you say in the fall, I think. Is that correct? You're about to come forward with some report on that? I'm not sure uh, what the council is referring to. Is there a part of the report? No. There are a number of accountability frameworks that are in place referred to in the report. Okay, so maybe I misunderstood what was coming. Are, are you and the and, and the lobby registrar doing a, a joint report that's coming in the fall, or did I misunderstand? Perhaps a misunderstanding. Okay, that's fine. So um, here's what I uh, I was going to ask if that report was going to cover, uh, but I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding, uh, uh, certainly on my behalf, a lot of uh, 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 unclarity around what it is um, that we are permitted um, as a matter of protocol to accept, uh, what it is uh, that, that we're not permitted to do. So I know that you're, um, uh, you've unwound, if I could put it, the whole sponsorship issue, um, but if you could uh, speak for a moment about gifts and what gifts um, uh, um, are permitted, particularly gifts around travel. Article 4 of Council's Code of Conduct sets out the gifts and benefits provisions that Council passed. Essentially, it works like this. 
We start from a position of a no gift and benefit policy that flowed out of the Bellamy Commission recommendations, but with a set of exceptions that are clearly defined in the Code of Conduct. Whenever counsel or a counselor has a question about a specific set of facts and whether or not it would fit within the Code of Conduct, my office is available to provide advice. And the very most important thing to know when giving advice is not to have it be general, but to have it to be specific, right. applied, and make sure all of the facts are out there. Once the counselor provides me with advice or with information as to exactly what it is that's being sought to accept, the advice is given and the counselor can rely on the advice. Okay. Um, and by the way, I, I, I think that this is all new territory, so I, I, I don't want to put any aspersions. I just want, we're either uh, going to continue this practice or not continue in this practice. So for example, um, if um, Invest Toronto um, decides that they're going to have business people contribute uh, to trips that staff and counselors go on, is that uh, covered in our policy? What I would recommend, because it, it sounds like a particularly specific situation you may have in mind, <laughs> is, yes. is I would recommend, my advice would be, yes. to first of all speak to the counselors who may have accepted trip money about the basis for it, try to resolve it, and if it can't be resolved, come to my office. Bye. I, I think that, and I do want to say that I think it's a confusing situation when a city agency, Invest Toronto, covers something, but the monies that are raised are from uh, many different business people, and it's not very clear. And I would argue that many of the councillors who okay, depend on this do not know. So I will come. I will speak about that, and I'm happy to bring it up with you. I'd raise it with council because I think that this sort of thing is the kind of thing that is behind this report. Councillor Mamalidi. Uh, I too want to thank you for uh, for your report. Uh, I just, if you don't mind, just kind of elaborate on. Sorry. I'm having a hard time hearing the question. There's a lot of sound behind me, Madam Speaker. Uh, okay, just a sec. Just a sec. Can I please ask to keep it down? There's a lot of, I don't know where this noise is coming from. Okay. I have no idea where the noise is coming from. There's a lot of noise. Yes. It's the media. Can I ask the media to keep it down, please? Please keep your interviews to later. Okay, Councillor Manlady. I, 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 this a simple uh, request to perhaps go over your suggestions on legal fees. We talked a little bit about that earlier. That was a part of your report. Maybe explain exactly what uh, what it is you're recommending. If I could ask the councillor which part of the report you had, legal? You had said that there was two parts of the equation. I looked for it. Oh, yes, yes. Very good. And, Thank you. And part of it was legal fees. Yes. The amendments to the former councillor expense policy that was brought by council in July requested that I look at corresponding amendments to the complaint protocol. And you will see at page four of the report, I have simply suggested to council that the piece in the current complaint protocol be stricken so that it's clear that the expense policy now governs and that councillors may use their expense budget for legal fees in relation to consultations for an informal or formal complaint. Okay, and, and, and I'm aware of it, so, but I want you to explain it. I think these councillors will need to know the difference between what was there before and what you're recommending, because they'll be supporting what you're recommending. Certainly, thank you, councillor. So at page four, there's a great area and what is being replaced is council's will, which is to allow councillors to use their office expense budget for more than just an initial consultation on a formal complaint, which is how it was worded before, but also if councillors wish to get some legal advice about an informal complaint, it will now be covered, and that's the will of council as of July, and this amendment will make sure that the two pieces synchronize. Okay. Is that clear? Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Mamalidi. Um, Councillor Mahavik, question to staff. Yes, th thank you very much. First, uh, some general uh, questions. Um, how many integrity commissioners are there now in the province of Ontario, recognizing that you know we were the first, but I don't think we're the only ones now? As of the date of the report, I believe 22, perhaps 23. And these are legislatively required, right? By province, by the province? No, the City of Toronto is the only municipality legislatively required. The Municipal Act permits other municipalities well, to 22. retain integrity commissioners. My apologies, and 22 of them have decided to take up the cost. So we're starting to develop some, what would you call it, jurisprudence as, uh, as provincial folks around the province? That That's right. Yeah. We're starting to see some more reports coming. And uh, are we the only province, or let's just use North America as a standard, um, I imagine there are integrity commissions all over the place. There are different kinds of, you can call them accountability officials in some countries, anti-corruption um, agencies, They're, they come in different forms, uh, but certainly uh, Canada is not the first to think of this. Okay, now my specific question is this. Um, is is there a best practice or options that are have been developed out there either at the city level or perhaps even at the province level for those kinds of cases where the breaches of the code of conduct are ongoing have been demonstrated have been researched have been demonstrated to be valid and where a particular member just continues the same practice with no regard and perhaps uh, no public shame in a particular practice. I'm not aware of any other municipality having any sort of best practice. I can tell you that uh, New York City is posting a website with a set of best practices that came about as a result of a conference that I attended in June and spoke at. And uh, I would be happy to look into best practices of the type that you've described to see if other countries or states have had similar, have something like that, but I, I'm not aware. Like, I'm, I'm wondering, is there any uh, jurisdiction that, for example, docks pay, or says you are now, you're, you as a, as a member cannot sit for a meeting or two meetings or whatever, in public recognition that uh, they have breached the code, they have repeatedly breached the code, and they show no, no remorse, and they're gonna breach the code again. Because all the, the worst that they can get is, frankly, a few negative, negative articles in the newspaper. Any integrity commissioner under the Municipal Act and Council is empowered to uh, recommend and approve sanctions. There are two sanctions mentioned in the Municipal Act, just as in the City of Toronto. Reprimand, suspension of pay for up to 90 days. So that does exist uh, as a matter of statute right now in Ontario. We, do you have that power to recommend that? Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's very helpful. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well, under what conditions would you list? Can I ask this then? Under what conditions would you see yourself um, making such a recommendation to council? I think the matter of sanction is one that has to be considered very carefully on each set of facts, and uh, hard to discuss in a vacuum, but. In a former report, um, I had referred to the fact that sometimes progressive style discipline might be appropriate when considering a recommendation for one thing versus another, but I, I'm, I'm leery of trying to set out right here at this moment the potential factors that might lead to that kind of recommendation. But something like um, breaking the code of conduct, being told of it, council affirming it, and it happening again, something like that uh, might be uh, where you would have to basically <laughs> adopt tighter measures of control or be what the sanction would be. I think the fair thing to say is that ultimately council is responsible for the ultimate sanctions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, what's... Um Councillor Bond, question. Thank you, and through you to the Integrity Commissioner. You, you say there's been a huge upswing in, in the volume of activity in the office, and I'm wondering if there are any patterns that you could tell us about that, that uh, we should be cognizant of. 
one of the patterns that we're seeing is a fairly large increase in the amount of web traffic on our website. What I've also noted is um, more attention being paid to the work of the office for a number of reasons. And it may be that citizens, as they become aware that there is a way to raise informally complaints in between elections, are making more use of the office because that's available. It's hard to tell with such a short time frame. We're just talking two-year comparison. So uh, I'm not sure if the sample size is big enough to be able to draw definite conclusions, but the trends seem to be that folks seem to know that this exists, they're taking advantage of it, and it's it's being used um, for the purpose it was established. So it would be fair to be a significant component of the upswing of, or the increase in, in, the, in the inquiries or complaints that are being lodged are being from outside City Hall in the City Hall, is that fair to, to, to say? That's, that's still the majority. Some complaints have come from within City Hall, from members or from members of staff but the majority do tend to be outside City Hall. And in terms of those, um, I know that, that, that there's a protocol of meeting uh, with employees or council members when there's a dispute that's internal to City Hall. Uh, what is your staffing ability to, to deal with the outside complaints? Because that creates a much bigger geographic spread as well as a much bigger uh, sort of network of people that you have to uh, be responsive to and, and do site visits to. So, what, what's the pressure that that's delivering to your office in terms of capacity, travel time, and all the other components? The office was created as a part-time office. Um, the numbers show that it is growing in terms of demand. Um, my term will be over in two years, and at that point, if we see these trends continuing, I will recommend to council that they consider um, increasing the complement, perhaps making it a full-time office, but it may be too soon to tell. At the moment, it means there's a bigger backlog, and I'm going to commit to try to reduce the backlog. But to answer your question directly about staffing complement, I'm a part-time integrity commissioner, and I have a part-time staff, one person. And in terms of the complaints that are coming from the outside as compared to the inside of City Hall, <laughs> is, there a, is there anything, any conclusions that can be reached regarding um, the, the, the validity of the complaints in terms of... of which complaints require more investigation more often than not? Is, is, are the internal complaints um, leading to more investigations or are the external complaints leading to a higher rate of investigation? In terms of timing, the, um, the internal complaints tend to be more encapsulated and not take as much time. Some of the external ones have taken significant amounts of time. And is that because of the inaccuracy of the complaint or the vagueness of the complaint as opposed to, or does it have to do with the nature of the complaint and the broad-based, you know, if a, if a member of the public has a complaint against a committee decision, you've got to then talk to everybody in the committee, whereas when it's one-on-one, -on -one, it tends to be two people and you can resolve the issue. Is it, is it an institutional complaint as opposed to a personal complaint? Is that part of the challenge? Uh, no, the challenge really is every complaint is its own country. And so it's the nature of the complaint that drives the amount of time. It, it may require, it may be a longer period of time rather than a, a one-off incident, or it may have, there may be more paper involved. Um, but to use the example that you presented of someone being unhappy with a committee decision, that, that would be a, an easy one to deal with in a way because it's not in my jurisdiction to second-guess committees and that's not a code of conduct issue. And then finally, um, sort of uh, delay, as, as a backlog builds and as, and as your office gets, gets burdened I guess, with, with, with more concerns, um, are people able to, to effectively not respond, not cooperate, and therefore delay a response and delay action on, on complaints that may be serious by just simply not playing along and not, and not uh, returning your calls or, or responding to your request for information? To date, we've been able to push out the complaints to the people who are complained of in a timely way. And there are a number of tools available to the office to uh, achieve compliance. If it became an issue, I would certainly raise that with council. At the moment, it's not an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Davis, questions? Uh, thank you, Speaker. I wanted to just follow on some of the questions that uh, uh, Councillor McConnell asked. Um, on page six, you do talk about the sponsorship policy and that, in fact, it says city sponsorship policy is the heading, and then it refers to the city donation policy and that that donation policy is in 
you expect to come before council this fall? Is it the sponsorship policy or the donations policy? Thank you. That, that does seem to be a typo. I believe it's the city donations policy. Okay, the donations policy we already have and the sponsorship policy we just approved. So this is to amend the existing donor, donor donations policy then, is it? I will stand to be corrected by you, Councillor. Um, I know we discussed both, and it sounds as though what you've just told me is what happened, so it sounds like it's done. Um, it was intended to tell Council that I met with members of staff from Partnerships Office about okay. these matters, but they, you're right, they're not the same thing. Um, because it does, it also uh, links uh, to the questions I have on page uh, 13, which have to do with the gifts and benefits reporting. Um, and donations. So I thought under the gifts and benefits uh, policy, counselors could receive up to $300 for a gift. If it was a protocol gift, such as being presented with something when you attended an event and spoke, but that uh, anything in excess of that was not allowed. Um, Kristen? And anything um, within that $300 you still have to submit um, a form to your office is that correct so the, the policy says within 30 days if it's over 300 you make the donation you fill in the form and send it to my office okay so there are only 31 donations declared here uh, over a full period for 44 counselors for every kind of donation they might get for a special event, um, is, is that correct? If they were to, you know, get a donation from Enbridge, although Enbridge is now a lobbyist engaged in business related to the city, they would no longer be allowed to make donations to a counselor, is that correct? Correct. Lobbyists may not give donations to a counselor for an event. That may explain why the numbers are as they are, but the number is accurate. So I just wanted to know if you thought third, are you, do you think that the counselors are all submitting every single donation they get? If there's only 31 forms completed here? And donations means in kind and cash. My office uh, provides information about what's required. It's stated in the Code of Conduct. Okay. I accept the donor declaration forms and I, I don't look behind the numbers. Okay. So if the city, if a city councillor gets a benefit from a donation that exceeds $300, but it comes through a division or a partnership or a sponsorship, is that acceptable? Again, it's hard to answer questions that are fairly general because there is a very detailed policy as to counselors, member organized events, donations for those events, which have traditionally been seen differently from ones where a counselor partners with the city for a city event. And so all I can do is say I'm happy to look at the policy, take the facts, and try to give advice based on them. Okay. If this... All right. So how would we go about asking you to do that? Um, I'm not sure it's clear whether we move, can move motions here and seek... Uh, ask you to pursue a particular new policy area. Is that the way it works? If it was a specific situation, the informal process is ideally suited for sorting out a specific situation. If it's a more general across the board matter, yes. Council has from time to time requested integrity commissioners to report back on changes to policy. And that can be done in consultation with any number of folks at the city and to bring it back to Council. Because it does seem to me that if a Councillor benefits by getting... Okay, Councillor Davis, your time is up. Yes, I know. And Councillor Moser. Hey, guys, come here. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, have you ever considered uh, 
uh, when a complaint comes in, if it's so outrageous that the uh, that the uh, action be taken against the person who's made the uh, made the complaint. I have to follow a counselor's counsel's complaint protocol, so there is no action to be taken against a complainant. However, there is the power in the office when complaints come in that are frivolous or that aren't based on any reasonable probable grounds or do not allege a breach of the, con the code of conduct to just write back to the complainant. The counselor isn't even notified and advise the complainant as such in writing. And a, a number of those are, are closed every year where the counselor wouldn't even hear about it. In a case where the uh, <clears throat> judgment of, of the counselor at work does cross the line, would you, uh, um, counselor, decides to take further action, would you be part of that? Uh, 